Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Interconnect 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, IBM. Hello everyone, you're watching uh, IBM Interconnect Conference live in Las Vegas. This is the special presentation of SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube. This is SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, joined by my co-host Dave Vellante and uh, guest Stu Miniman with Wikibon. Just put out some new research, they had a crowd chat. We are live in Las Vegas breaking down IBM's big moves into cloud, into technology, under the hood. Big show for IBM as a continue their transformation as a huge global multinational company, bringing the modern era technologies, a new way to think, a new way to do business. This is IBM's core theme. We're live inside the Go Social Lounge, a new digital experience that is, brings the bloggers, brings the crowd, brings everybody together, trending hashtags, crowd chats, all the top VIP influencers, and Veronica Belmont, who's hosting a bunch of videos. And this is a place where people can, can tweet, can chat, post on Facebook, put up photos, and of course, theCUBE is broadcasting live. It's our anchor desk, our ESPN of tech. Dave, um, watching the show. Stu, welcome to this segment. Thanks, guys. Uh, Stu, you're out on the floor scouring uh, for stories, you're talking to people, you're looking at the keynotes, you're hosting the crowd chat. Release some new data on infrastructure as a service. So I got to get your take. Dave and I have been talking about data oceans, data lakes, systems of records, systems of engagement. What is your take on what IBM's doing? Start the big picture and then drill down into some of the key areas. All right, well, yeah, John, you've thrown out a lot of terms there. I'll start with one of the big trends that I've been looking at for the last few years is really talking about distributed systems. Uh, here we are at this show, it's really a distributed, distributed conference. We've got, you know, two, two hotels, 21,000 people all over the place and, you know, bringing the cloud, mobile, social business uh, all into one place. Uh, you know, lots going on and uh, you know it, it, it's interesting to watch IBM as they take really these three shows and kind of munge them together there's some that fit together real nicely of course you know cloud enables mobility and social leverages a lot of these and, and some that it's going to take them a little while to kind of smooth out the edges and, and, and push things together some uh, so uh, you know it, it was a decent keynote this morning I, I'd love to get in a little more detail areas that I cover things like OpenStack uh, you know the, uh, IBM announced OpenStack as a service and there really wasn't much documentation or detail to be able to explain on it yet. Uh, enterprise containers is kind of interesting, leveraging, of course, Docker, uh, you know, the hottest trend I've seen, uh, not only the last couple of years, but, you know, almost ever. It's just, you know, thermonuclear how hot Docker's been. So, Stu, I got to tell you that I've heard Redis, Docker, Bluemix, a lot of good stuff going on in Bluemix. I mean, they're running fast, they're trying to go really, really hard, but can they go any faster without redlining their engine? At some point, can they pedal any faster? Go faster, people want to go faster, yeah, see the progress. Where are they and what do they need to do? So, so, so John, uh, Bluemix is, is, is doing well. I think, I think some good momentum there. Uh, Tim Crawford and I did a crowd chat earlier today and looking at infrastructure as a service, software we feel has a lot of good promise and there's a lot of things to be built off of it, but really doesn't feel like the, the IBM marketing engine has gotten behind it. It's some of the other things that you've mentioned there. Would, would love to see IBM you know, a little bit more forward uh, pushing their vision there and, and, and showing how partners and customers can take uh, take adoption of it. When, in the survey that we did, customers that were using IBM uh, gave them the highest marks out of any of the cloud providers out there. I mean, it, it's, it's real close in between them, but uh, you know, w w when when I talk to users, I don't hear SoftLayer talked about an awful lot. Well, let's back up a couple of years ago. Um, you know, IBM had that high profile, you know, head on head on with Amazon, AWS. You know, Amazon won in court, they won the deal. That was a wake up call for IBM. They'd already, uh, you know, initiated the soft layer buy, I'm sh sure. But subsequent to the soft layer acquisition, it's completely changed IBM's posture in the marketplace, Stu. And I want to get your opinion on this. So the last quarter, IBM announced that they had a 60% growth in cloud for the year. They said they, they're, they're, there's a $7 billion business. Now, that includes the private cloud. I mean, it's unclear what they're including on that. It's like when Microsoft talks about its cloud business. You know, Amazon doesn't really talk about its cloud business, although it talks about talking about its cloud business. Oracle does actually talk about its cloud business. It breaks it out. Um, but IBM also said, they gave another data point. They said our as a service business is running at a $3.5 billion run rate. So I feel like these large companies are waiting until it's big enough 
so that they can either claim leadership or maybe not divulge too much information to the competition. But what do you make of those numbers? A 60% growth rate, $7 billion business, $3.5 billion run rate on as a service. Yeah, so, so Dave, uh, IBM has a, has a really solid SaaS portfolio and their infrastructure and pass has also been doing well. Uh, the breakout I saw, uh, it was actually on, uh, gosh, uh, Business Cloud News, uh, it has uh, IBM's, just if you take infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and hybrid combined, IBM is 48% growth year over year. So that's, that's pretty good and puts them number three revenue behind only Amazon and Microsoft. Microsoft, so actually more revenue in infrastructure and platform as a service than Google does. Um, I still wouldn't call, you know, IBM one of the you know mega cloud providers. And even in the keynote this morning, Robert LeBlanc said, you know, we're not trying to be building mega data centers. We want to build, you know, local, regional. distributed, regional uh, pieces. They're adding services on top of it. Um, so you know, it's, it's a little difficult to pin down. You know, what do we call? How do we characterize IBM? Uh, software, in fact, is it really public cloud or is it hosted private cloud? Because I can get bare metal, I can really just put a lot of my own environment on a bare metal and do whatever I want with it versus uh, just taking services and using them, which is what we think of more from a public cloud provider. Yeah, I mean, I really, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly what's being counted. I would love to see a, a clean infrastructure <laughs> as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, and you're bringing up a really good point. IBM, under Steve Mill's direction, had purchased well over dozens, it's probably hundreds of SaaS companies. So that's all included in there. Really would like to better understand that breakout. I gotta, I, I gotta say, Oracle's the only company that I, I know of that breaks that out cleanly. Uh, Salesforce might as well, I, I can't say for sure. And obviously the SaaS guys do, but I'm not even sure Salesforce does, but it's nice, clean, infrastructure service, Platform as a service, software as a service. That's what I'd like to see more of, just so we can understand really what's in there because, like for instance, IBM did two outsourcing deals last quarter. One with Lufthansa, another one with um, ABN Ambro, Ambro. And they both involved cloud deals, right? So it was out billion dollar outsourcing deals, one billion, with cloud. So cloud, analytics, so they're sort of bundling in. You know, I don't know if that's in there or not, but so, but your point is that they're starting to be perceived anyway as a player. They've got reliability and, and security to their advantage, um, but it still feels disjointed to me. The whole market feels disjointed to me. Yeah, and, and Dave, I mean, Amazon, uh, IBM has some really good strengths on the analytics side. Uh, they're building out Watson and putting that into uh, some of the other pieces. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I overheard somebody talking about, if you listen to the keynote, it sounded like some of the other cloud solutions were, were following some of the same use cases that we heard from Watson, just in the medical field. Um, you know, IBM's taking their, their playbook and going to other parts of the business and trying to replicate the success uh, that, that, that they've had in the past. Well, it's not a bad strategy is to say, okay, just call everything cloud that could be cloud, put it into the cloud, and then get there, and then build a roadmap around it. I mean, that's not a bad strategy. I mean, you can you could say that's some cloud washing, but as long as there's R&D behind it and products come out of the pipeline, I really don't have a problem with it. I actually think it's smart. Um, but, you know, again, we, John and I were talking about this morning, when you look at IBM's growth initiatives, um, you're talking about 16% growth um, in, in, in it's a $25 billion business, talking about cloud, analytics, mobile, and social. There's a $25 billion business for IBM. That's 27% of the company's revenue. Sounds good, and it's growing at 16%. The problem is there's that other, you know, 75% of the business that's really under a lot of fire. The other thing, John and Stu, for IBM is, they got a lot of currency headwinds now. The, 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 the higher dollar accounted for 10 points of lost growth last quarter for IBM. So that's a real challenge, just perception-wise. But, Stu, what does IBM have to do to be number one in cloud, which is its stated goal? Well, it's a good question, Dave. Uh, one of the things is how much, if you, if you look, IBM has the cloud that they own, um, but then they have plenty of solutions that they could put into other clouds. So, um, I, I mean, I would walk through the show floor, and uh, there's, you know, the mainframe group. There's the power systems and all the pure systems that are going on there. How much can they push those into really the cloud service providers or uh, the managed service providers, I think is what IBM usually calls them. Um, and I haven't heard enough uh, from IBM on that piece of it because you know, there's there's lots of places where people are going to put their data. Uh, that application modernization takes a lot of time, so there's lots of companies helping uh, with that push. And 
you know, IBM historically is really good at working with a broad ecosystem, uh, but I, I still feel that I haven't seen enough, uh, you know, as to as to how IBM is really enabling those partners. Um, and I'll borrow a line from Tim Crawford: is uh, we're, we're talking a lot about the highway, and uh, we're not talking enough about the on ramps to to get us onto that beautiful road. Stu, I got to ask you about the, your 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 research report because share with the folks out there what's going on with infrastructure as a service. There's a lot of confusion around where the line is between platform as a service, and Dave and I were talking earlier this morning about the old way and the new way. They're not a rip and replace, the new way is clear, Redis, Docker, all this cool stuff with developer, yet I gotta, I gotta appease the infrastructure side where infrastructure as a service fits beautifully, converged infrastructure, web scale, but legacy, right, data center. So data center, hybrids, all coming together. Break that down for us, OpenStack is in the center of that. Sure. Uh, OpenStack's like the overlay little transitional opportunity. Do you see it that way? What's so, going on? So, so John, here's one of the challenges we have. So I'm an infrastructure guy by, by background, and when we think about the infrastructure that you know, my applications live on, it's very tough for me to sometimes break down that infrastructure as a service versus platform as a service, um, or says something goes uh, more like a software as a service. If we look from an application standpoint, it breaks down a little bit easier. You know, am I taking, you know, an existing application and just trying to move it somewhere, whether that be hosted, uh, you know, do I get a VM and put my application in it? Um, am I just buying a new application? You know, when I talk about CRM, people are going to Salesforce. I don't worry about, you know, well, what model is that? That. It's, I, I just do it, um, and you know, if if I'm moving to a new database, maybe I decide to go on Amazon. Maybe I decide to go on you know DB2, do some blue. Um, uh, you know, it's from an application standpoint. That's how most. IT uh, you know, practitioners should be thinking about things is my, I look at my, uh, my IT application portfolio and I figure out on a case by case, you know, what can I get to the new stuff, what do I have to just maintain for a while, and then where's the best place to do that? And you know, most IT people are really going to worry about, well, if I'm putting it on some public cloud, is that infrastructure services platform as a service? It's what's the application, does it deliver the services that my users need, does it give the mobility that I want? Um, and in, in many ways those lines are blowing. Amazon tries to blow away those lines. Microsoft uh, really started as platform and gone to the infrastructure layer. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm tired of arguing over some of those definitions because I think the applications. You're in, an analyst, uh, I could yeah. be tired of arguing, come on. No, <laughs> I, I, I like, but <laughs> stop arguing, go for the jugular right now. <laughs> Put it to bed, what's the issue? Yeah, so, so it's really about, you know, helping to modernize those applications, you know, don't let that legacy drag you down any further. Doesn't mean that you have to cut everything today and put it in the public cloud, but understand what you've got, have, have good understanding of where things, you know, what makes sense and what you should own and what you shouldn't. Before Dave wants to jump in, I know Dave wants to jump in, I got to ask you a question. So, Doug Bailoff said essentially the top conversation for IBM, and certainly his group with power is, uh, one of them is drowning in data, the other one's on-prem or, uh, or off-prem for cloud delivery, for the delivery of services. Totally makes sense, obviously ecosystem. Drowning in data. Will co more companies drown in data lakes or data oceans? What's your take <laughs> on that? Um, so, uh, well, John, if we go to the public cloud, isn't storage free? So, uh, you know, we're going to make that a little bit easier. Um, I, I, I've seen your conversations. Uh, I've never as, seen as a cost of ownership slide that had, a, had an iceberg on it in the lake. Icebergs are only in the North Atlantic. Yeah. But, but that being said, well, oceans or lakes? And uh, what do you prefer? Take, pick, pick a side. <laughs> Dave, bail me out on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, Stu. I mean, I think. Hey, I think what's your the, position? Uh, my position is, I, I, first of all, I like oceans. Oceans are bigger. They're more vibrant. They have currents. They're a broader ecosystem. I, I think lakes are. Lakes are like there's some big lakes. Je Jeff Frick pointed out there was surfing in Lake Tahoe on six foot waves, and, and yeah. there are some big but lakes. The ocean, but are, aren't you? Too many things are outside of your own control. You know, you, it crosses borders. There's yeah, security. You know, certainly outside security is the real. Yeah. Thing, so that's why so, I think yeah. it's a more accurate description. Huh. Right? Do, maybe yeah. I want the data reservoir. Is what I want. Data <laughs> lake's going to stay. <laughs> drink from the lake because of <laughs> fresh water. But no, the point is, I think they're both good. However, data lake is not the definitive thing to do. So again, this brings up the question of the technology to handle that. Uh, I had a great comment on uh, my Facebook page. Data oceans are for web scale, which just makes a lot of sense. A lot of stuff's happening. Um, what's going on with web scale? So uh, relative I mean, to the cloud, big guys, can, are the enterprise ever going to get web scale or? 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. That term uh, tends to get a lot of people riled up. I'll actually be sitting on a panel uh, at Interop this year uh, saying, you know, should your IT, you know, look like Google's? And of course, the short answer is no, of course your IT is not going to look like Google's, but can we learn from what Google has done and make things better? Um, it's, it's that balance between uh, the enterprise you know, has to spend way too much time creating bespoke IT and care in feeding the pets that I have, as opposed to Google focuses on their applications, they only have a small number of them, you know, Google and Facebook, and you know, we want to mention, monitor and uh, administer tens of thousands of nodes uh, with a single administrator. So, you know, you just use it, so, you know, Wikibon, since before I even came on board, has been watching that hyperscale or web scale market, and it definitely is bleeding into the enterprise quite a bit. Um, it shows huge promise, really the tip of the spear as to where things are changing. They were some of the first guys to really leverage Flash uh, to help rebuild uh, applications and it, it's having just a ripple effect uh, through the IT space. All right, so I'm going to jump in now, okay? So, uh, the, the, it seems to me, Stu, that, so Amazon comes out with AWS EC2 in 2006. To me, all the big guys, the cartel, stuck their head in their sand, in the sand, and said, oh yeah, it said, yeah that's fine, blah, 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 it's for developers, and it went on for a long time, right? And then we saw an uptick during the downturn, Everybody said, well, CapEx to OpEx. The big guys were sort of A, caught flat-footed, plus they were going through big transitions financially. Um, and so that slowed them down. Finally, they're coming around. It feels like, and, and I want you to get your take on this, it feels like IBM, HP, VMware, Oracle, I guess Cisco, you can maybe answer that, are finally coming around to the hyperscale guy's way of thinking. Now, the other piece of it is you got Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And everybody always said, well, they're the hyperscale guys, they're the big big whale, big interconnect guys. I shouldn't call them whales, because I think of enterprise whales, and then you got the, 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 the web scaler guys. They're the big web scalers. They have the cost structures. I see two things happening, and I want to get your take. Help us squint through this. Looks like the enterprise guys are finally getting their act together, and it looks like the hyperscale guys are learning how to play enterprise. So there's a really interesting dynamic where those two worlds are finally coming together and your survey results show that Microsoft in particular is doing very, very well there. We always, you know, we talk about Amazon all the time. We don't have to pump up them up anymore. And Google, there's a developer crowd there. So help us really understand and decode that matrix. Yeah, uh, a lot of good points there, Dave. So let's start here with IBM. Uh, you know, w one of the comments I made is that IBM is trying to take all of these open source pieces that are out there. Take OpenStack, for example, and just deliver it as a, serv as a service with, you know, Bluemix and SoftLayer and everything Cloud they're doing. Foundry. Let's take There's containers, one. which, you know, Google and some of these other guys are doing cool things. Let's do enterprise containers. And I sit here and I'm saying, that's great. We want to take these cool tools and make them available for the enterprise. But on the other hand, I, I look at the OpenStack community, I look at you know, DockerCon last year and the people using Docker. These are all the developers out there. These aren't the enterprise guys. You know, the enterprise guys are saying, oh crap, we need to take advantage of this stuff because you know, there's whole groups that are just disrupting us majorly if we, if we don't move. And you, you said right, the enterprise guys are, tr are trying to learn and harden and work on this and the developers are maybe doing a little bit of enterprise stuff but it's, there's still a, a big gap between those two. Does enterprise containers make sense to you? I mean, is it a real um, deal? I, 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 I like what I heard. Uh, I'd like to see more details on it. There's uh, you know, some good pieces. They talk about, um, you know, one of the best things about Docker is really the Docker Hub. And what IBM says is it's great that you can have a public repository uh, to be able to handle all these, but we're actually going to make private repositories for you because in your group or across maybe you know, a couple of partners, you're going to want to have some security and make things that are just for me, and there's there's goodness there, and I think IBM is offering some some things that you know people should look at, and it'll help make it easier to deploy. Uh, that being said, you know the kind of open and what uh, Kubernetes and Mesos are doing, um, are the, the the developer community are going to just grow like wildfire, and we'll see how much the developer way starts to overrun the enterprise versus the enterprise, you know, back to the taking over. Of IT. Yeah, well, yeah. My I, concern is that. Because Docker takes off, nobody saw it taking off except well, Furrier, you did. Actually, when Jerry Chen funded Docker, it was his first deal. No, no, you prior said, to Docker, I saw Jerry Chen at AWS reInvent 
a year ago. Yeah. And he was prospecting for the next Amazon. And he couldn't find it. But what he saw with Docker was an old concept that hit the perfect storm. I just tweeted this just now, I tweeted it out. The perfect storm for what the market needed right now. To galvanize the developer community for cloud scaling like apps, the perfect timing, open source was ready for it. It was, the temperature was perfect, the barometer, all the pressure points were in place. And Docker came in because they weren't threatening. They were just doing some great work. Yeah. And they're on their surfboards, they hit the right wave. And right, and so, so it explodes, nobody saw that coming. And then I feel like companies like IBM and others, VMware, we saw this at VMworld last year, they talk to their customers, they say, hey, this is hot, we want it, but this is some things it doesn't do, so they say, okay, we're going to do enterprise containers. Yeah. Now, my question is, how much of what they're claiming that they're going to have is real versus sort of in the pipeline of development? Can you just flip a switch and have enterprise? I mean, they have the capabilities to do enterprise, we know that, but can they marry it with things like Docker, you know, overnight? Yeah. Uh, let me go back to your previous question though, Dave. We were talking about hybrid. Hybrid is, in the survey that we did, the number one choice. It's what everybody is doing today. And if you look at the players out there, Microsoft was the one that scored highest in our survey because they've really got the best hybrid solution they out really there. They really do. They're right? one, of the, I mean, you know, one of the you know, two biggest public guys out there and they've got such a large footprint uh, in, in the private. They're really embracing open source a lot lately. I mean, Dave, if you told me, you know, yeah, told yeah. us 10 years ago, you know, oh, Microsoft's doing a lot of Linux and open source and giving away things to open compute, we would all have been like, what are you talking about? New Microsoft, right? you know, will just what buy that and Nadella kill it. So, right? uh, it. But some of it even started before Nadella. So, I mean, absolutely, Satya has done a lot, you know, to bring cloud first. Yeah, but wasn't he driving a lot of that? Yeah, some in the cloud space, absolutely, he was, was it? driving. Or was it his predecessor? Um, so, I mean. Was it Bahamar? Well, developers, 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 yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, that's always been the heritage of Microsoft, and yeah. that's, that's, that's fair. Okay. Yeah, but so, to, just to finish out that, that thought on hybrid, hybrid is, you know, Microsoft is killing it there. Um, numbers we've looked at, we really think within the next 12 to 18 months, Microsoft could be number one revenue uh, in public cloud. So, I mean, that's that's big. You know, everybody thought that Amazon's lead was just something that well, nobody would be able to you. catch. Is, is, does Amazon have its head in the sand when it comes to hybrid. Well, so. They, they don't really even use that term, right? No, they, they don't. And they're back at reInvent. Don't you think, don't you think Amazon, their public posture and what they're saying privately is different? Is, are you hearing that? In other words, public, they're recognizing on premise, okay, but, but privately, don't they want everybody to go into the AWS cloud, and, and, and is that reasonable within Dave, the enterprise? Dave, Amazon wants all applications in the public cloud now. And that's just not posturing, that's what they're pushing their folks in the field uh, to work on. And in, in some ways that's going to hurt them, Dave, because you know, if you, you look at our survey, you talk to any IT practitioner, it's, you, you've said public cloud is, uh, you know, it's an arrow in the quiver. And there, there's places where it makes sense to go full bore. Uh, absolutely, I might want to look at elasticity and buy by the drink, but it's not one solution, it's finding the right, the right fit, it's horses for courses for the different so, pieces. Uh, Sarbji uh, from Oracle, I think he's with Oracle. He says it says, his tweets as he's with Oracle. Uh, thanks for watching. It says at Stu nailed it. In cloud enterprises are a bit misled by success of the likes of Google's and Facebook. They have fewer homogeneous workloads, but enterprises have lots of heterogeneous workloads. Hug your developers if you have any exclamation point. Really, really good discussion. Yeah, that's a great point. When you have a heterogeneous network and you have legacy, it's always harder. It's always harder. Even talk about Google search engine. You couldn't, enterprise search is always hard from, from web search. Why? Clean sheet of paper, unstructured, if you will, and a lot of legacy. What was the, what was the stat that Mark heard throughout two open worlds ago that the average age of the enterprise app is 19 years? So, one, the life cycle of Software development in the enterprise has been slow, you know, the golden disk we heard at the end uh, of the thing is gone. DevOps changed the game. Hug your developers, implying, look at you got to have some developers in the enterprise. What's the plan? I mean, if you're an enterprise, you just can't go to the yellow pages and say, give me some uh, de you know, DevOps. Oh, by the way, I'm, I know Node.js, I took an online class in eighth grade. Eighth graders could be hired, potentially, but that's not enough experience to. Where are they going to find the developers? Yeah, John, just said that it's a great comment, push back. Uh, I did an infographic a year ago on hyperscale in the enterprise, and I got a ton of calls because it said, the enterprise has cloud envy. It's they're all jealous of the price points, and uh, I've talked to a lot of the Wall Street guys and what they're doing with software-defined networking, and as they're looking at cloud is they have IT staffs that 
you know, are big and they put, you know, millions of dollars into their IT budgets and they're tired of getting beat up saying, you know, why are you playing huge margins to these legacy guys and they want something what they think is better. Well, um, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I'm just writing a tweet back here. I'm going to comment on this, but in DevOps, some DevOps concepts scare the enterprise. And I've heard people saying, I run for the hills because I'm afraid I can't compete. New guy comes in, I'm going to get laid off, or all this change, what if the things break, I'm, I'm running a bank, so okay. It might scare a little people, they have cloud envy, I would totally agree, but here's the deal. The DevOps, cloud ops, whatever conversation, it comes down to engineering. We need more engineers to engineer the architecture. Big data, Stu, Dave, we've heard this in the queue many times. It's an engineer. It's an architect, in the big data side, whether you're a data scientist, cloud architect, DevOps, you got to be able to engineer the solution. Your take? Yeah, I mean, look, I've always said, John, it comes down to engineering, getting product through the pipeline, taking R&D and translating it into real product. That takes development effort, <laughs> it takes engineering, it takes you know, concerted market effort, you can't just wake up and say, okay, we're in the market. Yeah, um, to follow up on another point that you made, John, the refresh cycle is what's killing IT. Uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, David Floyer, our CTO, put out a note, uh, I think about a little over a year ago, and he said, never build another data center. Because when you build another data center, you're locked into that for like 35 years. And when you buy any infrastructure, it's what's your refresh cycle on that? It's like building you know, a football stadium. Oh, it, it, you know, you're, 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 oh, the you're, life cycle you're, of a data center is probably longer. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, the the average data center lasts longer than the average marriage does. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you've got a lot of challenges there. Um, the, the, the advent of cloud is really, I should be able to, uh, you know, use what I need today and be able to change and grow and move in the future going forward. Um, it's, you know, we're using legacy applications uh, for, for way too long. Um, I'm using all of my infrastructure for longer than I need to. It's not performing up to the newest piece. So you, you want to be able to buy things that uh, allow you to add new functionality, scale, get rid of things like migration because that's just huge amounts of waste uh, on uh, moving from one thing to another and having to upgrade. So, you know, lo lots of challenges there. Um, and, you know, there's, there's newer models to, to, go, to, to go to. I'm, I'm not saying everything goes to the public cloud. There's lots of options in private, hybrid. Uh, John, a quick question back to you. I did turn the table, you know, a couple of years ago we were all arguing, you know, is hybrid cloud a halfway house? And we think that, you know, f at least from the research I've seen, this is really where it's going to be for many years. And it's, you know, where okay, does the so water level, you know, Are you asking you know, if raise? I want to fall on my sword? On the no, no, I say well, to, to look back now and say, you know, is this, a, you know, are we halfway towards a journey towards, you know, there yeah. or? So, you know. so you were talking about the comment about Pat Gelsinger yeah. when they launched Hybrid Cloud three years ago. Here's what I said. It seems like it was cobbled together as a visionary document, more of a directional guiding principle statement, and now they're there. So vSphere recent announcement is interesting. They are there. IBM's the same way. IBM is directionally correct. All their messaging, I believe they're on the right vector for innovation. But it is a halfway house, Stu. It's a middle layer. If you look at the stack, it's the same game, different generations of computer industry. Lower ends of the stack, more hard, hardened, networking, you know, all that stuff. It's the OSI model of the 80s, middle of the stack, protocols, apps at the top. So when you look at the stack here, if you look at infrastructure as a service and data center technologies on-prem, that's classic lower end of the stack type software. The middle layer, platform as a service, hybrid, essentially a private cloud in the cloud, right? Okay, well, give or take, that's over oversimplification. And then full public cloud. So apps have to traverse, in my opinion, those three things. So yes, it's a halfway house because the enterprise really aren't ready, so it's, it's, a, it's a way station, if you will, as Pat Gelskin didn't like that term, halfway house, but my point is, most people aren't deploying full on public clouds, they're not deploying full on hybrid clouds. Their nirvana was private cloud, which was what they really want. So they want the data center in the cloud, which becomes private. So you can parse the definition. So I still think today it is a middle ground to the public cloud, which is the best economics, in my opinion. But where you're born, born in the cloud, born in the hybrid, born in the data center, the apps yeah, have to work I, I would say we're all hybrid shoppers these days. I buy lots from Amazon, but I still go to the local grocery store. Uh, you know, my neck of the woods, I can't get the you know, delivery like maybe you can out in the Valley, John, but uh, well, Steve, you know. Think about it, so you're technical, right? You've been yeah. a CTO in, in, in those roles. If you're building apps, right, you need to have choice. You have to have the ability to, to plug and play. By having those three areas, your app workloads can be tailored based upon one, economics, workload criteria, resources, cost, economics. So now you have you can move those resources around. So from a developer standpoint, 
that's the beautiful thing, is that making that abstraction layer that makes that go away is the final destination. Complete abstraction between on-prem, private, hybrid, and public. All right, Stu, thanks a lot, Dave. Appreciate you. We've got our next segment coming up. You're watching theCUBE live in here in Las Vegas. We will be right back with our next guest at theCUBE, extracting the seeds from the noise. IBM Interconnect in the Go Social Lounge, theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. We'll be right back. <laughs>